I want to start with a confession. In preparing this talk, I was thinking about my own choices that I make as a consumer. And uh, I realized that in the past year, I bought computer equipment or smartphone equipment or clothes or shoes without inquiring if anybody, if, if child, child labor had been involved in producing those products. Uh, or in buying clothes if the cotton um, used in those clothes had been manufactured using pesticides that are killing bees, for instance. So I probably made choices like that without thinking about it. Now, how many people are like me in that respect? Raise your hands if you probably bought products without thinking about child labor or pesticides or... Right. So we are sometimes thoughtless in, in this the choices we make when we buy stuff. And on other occasions... I'm building up the tension here. <laughs> on other occasions, we are harshly awakened by reality. For instance, this is a picture of uh, dogs that were, are recruited um, during the Yulin Dog Meat Festival that's held every year in China. So it's a festival, it's a party, where they eat dogs and they collect them from all over, from all over the place. Now, imagine you're there, you're on a holiday there, and you're with friends, and you're walking down this, down this marketplace with dog meat, and your friends ask you, Go on, have a bite of dog. It's great, have some. Now, how many of you would not have it? How many of you would say, no, thank you, I'd rather not eat dog? Right, so you wouldn't. Yes, I agree, because it's pretty horrifying, right? And yet, we are doing something very similar when we eat pigs, right? M most of us eat uh, meat. And um, that could be from cows or pigs, but I'm focusing on pigs now, because they're very similar to dogs. They're, uh, pigs and dogs are um, they're both social animals, they're, they're sensitive, they're, pigs are playful animals, they're, they're even more intelligent than dogs, they're cooperative, and they can really be a, a, a pet, they can be a friend to humans, and I know this from, from experience, yeah, they can be friends with dogs, but they can be friends with people too. And I know this from experiments, because this is Harry, and I adopted him when he was two, and he'd been living in a house with a family. He grew up there when he came there when he was little. And uh, as it often goes, he became too big. He was, he was actually sleeping in bed with their 12-year-old daughter. And, but he became too big, and uh, so he had to go away, and I adopted him. And Harry and I were great friends, and he used to, he used to even when I, um, he used to let me rub his belly. So when I caressed him, he used to lie on his back and let me rub his belly. But of course, as I said, um, pigs are group animals. They want to be together, just like people and monkeys and rabbits and dogs. And of course, I could not be his companion all the time. So enter Sally. And I called her Sally, as in the movie, When Harry Met Sally, because... <laughs> And that was really appropriate, because their, um, their acquaintanceship was very difficult, because you have to imagine Harry had never seen another pig before in his life. So he was very scared of her, but after a while, they were sleeping together like a real couple. Happy end. But in Holland, we have, only in the Netherlands, we have 12 to 13 million pigs, and there are 30 million pigs born every year, and we never see them because they're isolated in big industrial buildings that have been perfectioned to efficiency. This would be a perfect system if it, in terms of cost efficiency, because um, it would be perfect if there were no live animals inside, but there are, and these are living creatures who have the need to explore their environment. They have the same basic instincts that we all have. They, want, they don't want to be locked up. They, do, they don't love iron nests. They want to be able to build their own nests when they get piglets, and they want to be able to nurture their children, and they want to interact with each other, and they want to stay alive, just like all of us. 
Now, this is something that we usually don't think about because these pigs are hidden away in these big styes. And sometimes we're reminded of it by our children. When children grow up and they realize that the meat they eat comes from live animals, and they say, Mommy, I don't want to eat this animal. And then parents often say, But honey, the animal doesn't mind because they were raised especially for this. And that's how we soothe the children. So we, in our society, we tend to think of these animals as meat. They're just meat. And we are socialized into a world in which animals and, and other, other natural um, resources are seen as to be exploited by people. We're socialized into this world and we think it's normal. But of course, and, and there's a lot of money going on also in the livestock uh, industry. So there's a lot, lot of money going around and the stakes are high. Uh, but of course, the costs are high as well. For instance, as I just mentioned, it harms animals and that doesn't really affect us directly. But of course, it's, it's not really, really a part of what you'd imagine as a civilized society, is how you treat animals that way. It also is damaging to public health because we eat much more meat than is healthy for us and not enough vegetables. And in addition, there's the matter of animal diseases like Q fever, for instance, and um, uh, resistant bacteria coming from animal farming. So that's another problem. Also, you have to realize that in terms of production, um, a pig or a cow is a very inefficient protein factory because you need a lot of grain and soy and water to produce a single kilogram of meat. So it's very inefficient. We're cutting down forests on the other side of the world to get the meat that we give to our pigs and cows. It pollutes the air, the water, the soil, so it's, it's very uh, bad for the environment. And of course, there's the issue of climate change, which is also getting to be a big problem. And most people don't know this, but livestock farming is the, the number two cause of climate change. It comes after fossil fuel. It, it, it contributes more than transportation, for instance. So these are big problems. Of course, the good news is that we are now able to create uh, uh, meat substitutes and you can um, go directly from the plant or the grain to the meat substitute and there's not the animal in between. Now this solves all of these problems at once. And the funny thing is, if you talk to this about people, to, if you talk to people about this, they, they, there are many, many times their response is, but I like meat. It's, it just recently happened to me on Twitter that someone said, too bad for the climate, I like meat. Now this is, this is interesting because, um, because we, many people, want to have their five minutes of pleasure and they think it's perfectly normal that that weighs up to all the problems for the animals, for the environment, for the world food supply, the climate and so on. You want to have your five minutes of pleasure. So how is it acceptable that we could just say, I like meat, too bad for the climate. Why do we accept that? I think it's because we don't hold each other accountable. And this is to do, and this is not just not just about meat, I'm focusing on meat production here because that's the area that I know most about. But this is a much more general problem. We, we think it's perfectly normal in our society to take away a calf from its mother after it's just been born, take it away because we want to drink the milk that the mother is producing for the calf. We find that perfectly normal. But this also happens, for instance, when we buy plastic or products with microplastics in them, knowing about the plastic soup and still buying those products. Or, as I indicated earlier, buying products involving child labor. And generally, we are very oriented towards the price of what, we're, what we buy. And we, we're interested in low prices. And we rarely ask the question, who is, who is paying, who is allowing this to be so cheap? Who is paying the price on the other side of the world or animals or generations after us? We rarely ask this to ourselves and we rarely ask each other. And that's important because people just like pigs, people just like pigs and cows 
And dogs are social animals. They, they synchronize their behavior, they imitate each other, and in many social situations, we tend to go along to get along. We go along with the group. If everybody's having fun, everybody's having a party, and everybody's enjoying all the good stuff that we have, then you don't, you don't want to be the party pooper, right? You don't want to be the one nagging, how was this made, and where did it come from, and who is paying the price for this on the other side of the world. You don't want to be the one doing that. So generally, because we're social animals and we want to keep social relations good, we tend not to ask these questions. And also, we tend to get information from the behavior of other people. So, for instance, when you're walking on the street and you see all these people looking upstairs, what are you going to do? Obviously, you're going to be looking up too, because everybody's looking up, so there must be something there that's interesting. So you get information from other people's behavior, and this happens also in a well-known problem called the bystander effect, which is, has been researched to very thoroughly in my research field, social psychology, is when, when there's a, an accident or something wrong and you're not really sure what's going on, like in this picture, you're not sure if this guy is a drunk or maybe something happened to him and he needs help. So what are you going to do? You're looking at other people to see how they respond. And you think, if this is really a problem, then somebody would be responding now. And because nobody's acting, you're assuming it's, everything is fine. So we use the information from others' behavior and we don't realize that they know as little about the situation as we do. So in situations like this, we're all ignorant and we're all looking at each other and not acting. So the more bystanders there are in a situation like that, the less likely it is that the person lying there is going to get help. Uh, similarly, and this has also been researched, when, a, when there is smoke coming out of a house or a room, if you were walking there on your own, of course you would go look if there's somebody in there or you would, would dial the emergency. Uh, but if there are other people passing by and not doing anything, very likely that you're not doing anything either, because you think somebody must have done something, done something about it by now. And if they haven't, then it's probably not serious. So th this means in situations like that, when we're all facing an, an ambiguous situation or an emergency, we're not acting and we're all ignorant, all of us together. We don't know what's going on and we're not acting. And sometimes this ignorance is convenient because it means you don't have to do anything. You can just carry on with your nice little life and you don't have to act. And that is often called willful ignorance or deliberate ignorance or tac tactical stupidity. Because it means you, your ignorance is very convenient for you. Now, I feel comfortable now using this quote now that Bob Dylan won the uh, Nobel Prize. The question is, how many times can a man or a woman turn his head pretending he just doesn't see? Or, in the words of another writer, facts do not cease to exist because they are ignored. To us, it's convenient to look at animals as just meat. But to them, they are live animals with feelings and, and they suffer. To them, the reality that we don't see is true. Or you can deny climate change or deny that humans are responsible for it, but it's still going to come and it's, it's going to change all of our lives dramatically, even if we deny it. And we're actually looking at a burning house in, in terms of climate change. The climate change is much further along the way than this house already. And we're all looking at each other and not acting. And the big companies are just keep, they keep on going, producing uh, the, the emissions that create the climate change. And the government's not, not doing much either, not enough. It's taking, taking them very long to act. So the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men or women, again, to do nothing. And this, this is like a, a, a bystander effect on a societal level. We're all looking at each other, assuming if this was a serious problem, somebody would have done something by now. 
And we're also, we're also looking at the government. But the, the government is thinking, well, the people are still buying the meat and they're buying the, the products that create climate change. Uh, and they're, they're not voting for political parties that make this a big issue because in their voting behavior, people typically look at their spending power. So we worry about the money, about our spending power, and we don't worry about who else is paying the price. So we're all looking at each other and blame the retailers are responsible. We think the retailers should make a change, but the retailers say, hey, this is what the customers are buying. This is what, what, we, what they want. So we're all doing nothing and we're not even doing nothing. We're, act, we're actively contributing to this because we're giving the retailers money. For instance, when we buy meat, we're giving them money and we're saying, Here's my money, keep on going. I want to make an investment in your industry. And that's how it's interpreted, how we act. So this is really interesting because people are a very intelligent species. We are capable of amazing things. And we see ourselves as the superior species in terms of intelligence. We have the ability to look ahead, to look at the long-term consequences of our behavior. We have a sense of morality other than other animals, and yet we are acting like sheep. And we're all looking at each other. See the, see the faces of the sheep? They're all looking at, who, me? No, I'm not responsible, somebody else is responsible. So we're using our intelligence to, to find reasons why somebody else is responsible. And what we're really doing, what, what our driving motive is, is we want to party. So that's the one thing that motivates us, is we want to buy these products and we want to buy them for as little money as we can. And whenever someone says, maybe should, we should reduce the availability of some of these products, maybe we should make them less easily available or more expensive, then we're going to protest, then we're going to say, Hold on, I want my choice of freedom. I want to have, have, the, have the ability to make these decisions and choose from all of these products. Now, this is interesting because we, it feels to us as though we're making free choices here, but how free are we really? I think generally the driving force, as sophisticated as we are, the driving force for us is what we call in psychology the pleasure principle the pleasure pain principle, which means that any animal is motivated to approach pleasure, to seek it and to avoid unpleasure, unpleasurable things or discomfort or difficult things. So we want to approach things that feel good immediately, instantly. It's pleasurable and I want it here and now. So sophisticated as we are, in that respect we are still cavemen who want their pleasure here and now. I like it, that's the driving force, and it has to be cheap, it has to cost not a lot of money, that makes it easy, and because we're group animals, we're looking at each other and imitating each other, and that's why it's fine to buy this, and we don't worry about where it came from, or how it got there, or what the big companies put in it, like salt and sweet and fat to make it taste good. Breaking free, breaking free from this requires that we really start using our intelligence. It requires that you get informed about the products that you buy, which is sometimes very difficult. It requires that you control the urge to go after things that immediately give you a sense of it feels good and that you look at the long term and at the kind of person you want to become eventually. And it requires that you are sometimes willing to be the party pooper, to speak out and say, is it all right what we're doing here? And because people are social animals, you can contaminate them. So we can contaminate each other with ignorance and with, with immoral short-run behavior, but we can also contaminate each other with intelligence and wisdom and awareness. So, Act as if what you do makes a difference, because it does. It makes a difference to other people, to the world, to the animals, and you can influence people, even if you're not aware of it, by your own choices. But most of all, it makes a difference to yourself, because, of course, you want to be an intelligent person who makes 
choices that fit with the values that you believe in. You have, you have a mind, you have the intelligence, and you have the ability to make free choices. Start using it. Be smart, be congruent to the values you believe in. Be brave, be somebody. Thank you.